This sermon is titled Jesus' Teaching on Prayer, Part 8. Be enriched as you listen. We've been on a very long journey following Jesus in prayer. And uh, this is part, what is it? Part 9 in this series. We've got one more, part 8. Uh, we've got one more to go. We'll, we'll conclude this next Sunday. And uh, we've been studying the life, the teaching, and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Two Sundays back, Jean uh, shared with us on intercessory prayer. Now that Sunday, Amy and I were at our east location, so we were missing in action, but <laughs> she ministered to us. Uh, she shared on uh, intercessory prayer, what Jesus taught on uh, intercessory prayer, and what he demonstrated through his own uh, life of prayer. Today, what I want us to do, and I'm just titling this message, Jesus Teaching on Prayer, and I just want us to focus in on those passages that we have not yet gone to. Those passages where Jesus is teaching on prayer, which we have not yet gone to. So we're going to do that today. So uh, it's just going to be kind of a, an assortment or an assorted collection of passages. Uh, different things that Jesus said concerning prayer that we want to pay attention to this morning. And the next Sunday, we will conclude uh, the sermon series by looking at what the Lord Jesus is doing today in heaven. His high priestly ministry. The fact that he's spending his time in heaven actually in prayer. That's just an amazing thought. That he would be continuing to engage in prayer up in heaven. And we'll focus on that next Sunday. So I want to begin by looking at this passage where Jesus taught us to pray for those who mistreat you. Pray for those who mistreat you. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, Jesus said this. He said, You heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So notice what Jesus is saying. Here's what you do for people who hate you, who might persecute you, who might speak evil against you, mistreat you, be unfair, unjust to you. What do you do? He says, Love them, bless them, do good to them, and pray for them. And that's not easy. Because honestly, when somebody is mean to you, it hurts. It hurts. God, I, I feel it. I feel hurt. They are saying these things. They are treating me like this, they're not being fair, whatever. It hurts. But Jesus is saying, when people treat you like this, this should be your response. Love them. Bless them. Do good to them. And pray for them. And he continues, he says, do it because... This is what expresses the fact that you are a son and a daughter of your heavenly father. Because children imitate their parents. As sons and daughters imitate your heavenly father. Look at your heavenly father. He makes the rain to fall and the sun to shine on the good and the evil. All of you have the rain. 
all of you, enjoy this time. Good and evil. And he says, you be like that. Be like your heavenly father. Now it's not easy for us to do this. Do this. And uh, this kind of conflict can happen in all kinds of situations. It can happen in your home. Maybe your spouse. Maybe some other family member, relatives could say and do things that hurt you. It could happen in the workplace. Your manager or your peers, your colleagues could say things that hurt you. It could happen in church. Hello. There could be people in church who sometimes say and do things that really hurt. It could happen out in the world. Generally, you're moving around with people and you face these kinds of hostile actions or words spoken. Remember what Jesus taught us. So when people hate you, when they mistreat you, and they even persecute you, here's what your response should be. Love them, bless them, do good to them, and pray for them. So you go in your prayer time. Say, Father, so-and-so has said this. It's hurting me, God. I mean, you be honest with God. You don't have to pretend. If it's hurting, it's hurting. And God knows you are hurting. So just go and tell them, God, uh, they are, they've done this. Or they're saying this. So they're treating me like this. It is hurting. But because, Lord Jesus, you told me to bless them, because you told me to pray for them, Lord, Help me to love them. Let your love flow through my heart. Let there be no bitterness. Let there be no anger or hatred in my heart towards them. Let your love flow. And God, I pray you bless them. God, I pray that you do good to them. That's hard. But he told us to do that. When you pray. So we do that. And the Lord Jesus himself set us the greatest example. Can you imagine on the cross, Luke chapter 22, on the cross, while he's being crucified, he's praying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Father, forgive them. While he's going through that, he's praying, Father, Forgive them. And he said, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to pray like that. But this is something you and I must learn. I'm not saying it's easy, but we can do it. Because he said, you be perfect like your father who's in heaven. You, you try to be that way. You imit imitate the father. You try to be that way. Be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Another thing the Lord Jesus taught us concerning prayer is He taught us not to use prayer as a pretense of spirituality. Don't do that. He said, don't do this. So don't do this with prayer. Don't use prayer as a pretense for spirituality. I will look at two passages in Matthew 6, verse 5 to 7. He said, when you pray... Don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, you go to your room, when you shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. A related passage, Matthew 23, verse 14. He rebukes the scribes. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' home, homes, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. So he says, you know, when you pray, don't do this. Don't use prayer to be seen by men. 
Like, don't do it as, you know, something that you're doing to impress somebody. Don't do that. Don't use prayer for that. Don't use, when you're, when you're praying, don't use vain, thoughtless, meaningless repetitions. I have to say this 25 times, and then God will answer my prayer. No, don't do that. And he says, when you pray, don't make this pretense in front of people. These long prayers to make this pretense. That means don't use prayer as some sort of a badge of false spirituality in, the front, of, in front of people. Instead, be happy when to go pray by yourself alone. You know, pray by yourself. Father who sees you in secret, he will reward you. Now, we understand that there will be times when we are praying in groups. Maybe two or three, or maybe as a church, we collect There's a time when we pray together. And so obviously those prayers will be made in public. You know, either they'll be leading in front or you'll be praying openly. Uh, so it is in public. But the point is, what's the position of your heart? Are you doing it in order to impress somebody? Oh, that person will think after they hear me pray. And I quote from Genesis to Revelation. They will, they will be so impressed with my prayer. Is that the motivation? Or is the prayer... Just plain, simple, sincere. Is it coming from your heart? Are the words you're saying words that do you really mean? Or you're just using all the words in the Christian dictionary? 2023 edition. <laughs> Those are vain repetitions. Or are you just, just saying what you feel in your heart? You mean everything you say. That's it. So he says, don't use prayer for that reason. And if you do, he says, look, you've all got your reward. There's no need for God to give you any answer. Your reward is this cheap publicity that you get. And he actually warned. He said, you know, if you're going to do that, actually, they're going to bring condemnation on yourself. Don't even use prayer. For that purpose. Keep it simple. Keep it what say it from your heart. Say it as unto the Lord, even when you're praying in public. Be sincere. And your father who sees the sincerity of your heart, the father who sees you, he will reward you. Another thing we observe in the life of Jesus is how he took time. To pray and bless people who would not be able to repay him in any way. We see this in Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 to 15. The little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But his disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Let's try to imagine this incident, right? Jesus is there. The disciples are standing all around him and he can imagine all these parents from children's church. They're bringing all the children. They want Jesus to lay hands on their children, pray and bless them. And the disciples think they're doing their job. They say, hey, no, 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 no. Only appoint, by appointment only. You have appointment? No. Go, 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 go. <laughs> by, they're just trying to guard Jesus. They're to protect. And Jesus says, no, no, let them come. Because God's kingdom is made of such kind of people. Childlike. This is what the kingdom of God is. And he takes the time and the effort to lay his hands on each one of the children and pray for them. Bless them. My takeaway from this is if G Jesus took time to pray and bless little children who would 
would not be able to repay him in any way. Perhaps they didn't even understand the importance of what he was doing for them. And yet he took the time and the effort to do that. Take away. Would you and I take the time and the effort to pray for people who may not be able to repay us in any way? But you say, I will pray and bless them. I pray and bless them. They can't repay you. They, don't, they may not even understand the significance of what you're investing, the time and the, what you're investing for them. But Jesus said, let them come. I'll, I'll pray. I'll do it. Did the kids understand what Jesus was doing? Most likely not. But he took the time. He made the effort to lay hands on each of them and pray. See, many times we are ready to pray for important people. I'll tell them, I was praying for you. Maybe they can repay me something. What, would you pray for some, someone who would not be able to repay you in any form or fashion? Would you be able to take time and make the effort to pray and bless their lives and give into their lives? But you know that they could not repay you anything. But they are important enough to God for you to pray and bless their lives. Would you do that? I think we can all make the efforts to do something like that. To pray and bless people. Another thing, Jesus, we see the life and ministry and teaching of Jesus is he emphasized that the house of God should be a place of prayer, healing, and praise. We read this in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 17. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And he said to them, yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. Three things that Jesus emphasized. One, the house of God will be a house of prayer. Second, the house of God will be a house of praise. The children are praising Jesus. Hosanna to the son of David. And all the Pharisees, they're upset. So how can you let this happen? They're praising. Oh, it's, that's, what, that's exactly what's written. Out of the mouth of children, praise will rise. So the house, there will be praise in the house of God. Thirdly, through what he did, the house of God is a place for healing. And people come and they should be healed. So through what he's taught and what he did, he said, the house of God will be as a prayer, a place of praise, and a place of healing. But he was also very expressive of what it should not be. So in the temple, there were these people who were buying and selling, money changers and animal sellers. And he said, you've made this house of a place of merchandise. So no merchandise. No buying and selling. And if you understand what was happening in those days, when people travel long distances to come and offer sacrifices, they didn't carry their sacrificial animals with them. They came to the temple and they bought the animals there. So these people took advantage. Like the prices of tomato and onions, they were, you know, 50%, 100% more. And they made profit, huge profits, huge merchants. 
So they come. They're selling their animals. They're selling their birds. Making huge margins. Stop merchandising the house of God. It's not a place for business. And then he got with these scribes and Pharisees. They wanted the house of God to be a place of dead religion through which they could control the people and a place for politics so that they could play politics with the Roman government but keep their own power. And he rebuked them. So very clearly, the house of God is not a place for merchandising. It's not a place for dead religion to control people. And it's not a place for politics. It's not. You don't use the pulpit to promote politics or any political party. You don't do that. That's not for the house of God. Amen? Amen? But the house of God is a place for prayer, praise, and healing. Now, Jesus was so agitated. I mean, he took the thrill seriously. Because, you know, when he saw this happening, these people were merchandising. He came and he threw the tables. I mean... You have to picture this loving, kind, gentle Jesus suddenly getting so agitated. He's pushing tables. I mean, how would you feel if you saw the pastor turning a table over? I mean, you'd be, click, put a head. Pastor did this. He pushed the table over. And Jesus was not just pushing a table over. He was chasing them out. Meaning, he was so agitated about this matter. He said, like, this is serious stuff. This should not be happening in the house of God. You cannot be buying and selling in the house of God. You cannot make the house of God a place of dead religion. You cannot make the house of God a place to promote politics. Get it out. The house of God must be a place for prayer, praise, and and so I want to invite you and me as people to guard that, protect that, protect the sanctity of the house of God. Amen? Keep it for prayer, for praise, for the healing of broken lives. Keep it for that. Two more passages, two more teachings from the life of the ministry of Jesus. He taught us, he taught us to come with humility before God. That when we come before God in prayer, we must come humbly. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, he spoke this parable. He said, some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and another a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed, thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not as so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus taught us, this is how you come before God. Don't come before God on the basis of your own merits. Lord, I have been living such a good life. I've been, you know, doing this and doing that. And therefore, I'm coming before. No. So when you come before God, come before Him on the basis of His mercy. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now as New Testament believers, we know that 
The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed us, washed our sins away. The blood of Jesus Christ has opened up for us a new and living way that we could come boldly before God to the throne of grace. So we come with confidence. We come with boldness. We come knowing we are sons and daughters of God. And yet we come humbly because it's only His grace. It's only His mercy that has given us that privilege. So it's not on the basis of my works, but it's on the basis of His mercy and grace that we come before God. Say, God, thank you. I can come and pray. I can come and talk to you. I can come and, you know, worship you. It's just your mercy. It's your grace. It's what Jesus did for us on the cross that enables us to do this. Not my works. Now, yes, we've got to live godly lives. We've got to live righteous lives. Uh, all of those things are important. But when we approach God, we are pure to come base or come on the basis of His grace and mercy. And when we do that, He says, you humble yourself before God. He will lift you up. He will exalt you. The last passage we're going to look at, worship Tim, please come. The last passage we're going to look at is that Jesus taught us to pray and stay in readiness for His return. Prayer, a life of prayer, is going to help us stay ready for His return. We'll look at these two passages. Mark chapter 13, verses 32 to 37. Jesus said, Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants, to each one his work, and commanded the doorkeepers to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. A related passage, Luke 21, 34 to 36, Luke puts it like this. He says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with caressing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So another part of Jesus' teaching was this. He said, you need to watch and pray in order to be ready for the return of the Lord. You don't know when He's coming. So be watchful. Be observant. See what's going on around you. Be alert. Don't go to sleep. Watch like a watchman. Be on guard, alert, watch. You're looking at the signs of the times. These things are happening. There are so many of them are the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I'm getting, I understand that we're getting closer and closer to the coming of the Lord. Watch and pray. Be in a place of prayer. Be in a posture of prayer. And work. Do what you're supposed to do. Work. Watch, pray, keep doing your work. Be faithful in that. And he also warned us, don't get caught up in the pleasures and the responsibilities. Don't get caught up in that. Now, we do enjoy our life and we do have responsibilities, but don't let them preoccupy you. Don't get caught up in those things. But instead, stay in a place of watchfulness, prayerfulness, and do your work. So that you can be ready anytime. We don't know when the Lord is coming, but whenever He comes, if you are in this place of watchfulness, prayerfulness, just doing your work, you will be ready for the Lord should He come in our lifetime. Ready. So it's not very complicated. Be watchful. 
Be prayerful. Do your work. You will be ready for the coming of the Lord. So just to recap some of the teachings of Jesus on prayer that we consider today. First, pray for those who mistreat you. If there are people who are not treating you right, pray for them. Love them, bless them, do them good. Pray for them. Second, we shouldn't use prayer as a pretense of spirituality. Don't. Be sincere. Just say what's in your heart. Talk to God. Third, pray and bless. Take the time to pray and bless people, especially those who may not be able to do anything for you. Take the time. Give it to them. Number four, guard the house of God. Keep it a place of prayer, praise, and healing for people. Keep the merchandising. Keep dead religion. Keep politics. Keep it out. When we come before God, come with humility in prayer. Come humbly based on His grace, His mercy. And watch and pray to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Anytime, He'll come. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. This morning, if there's anything that we've read from the teachings of Jesus and you feel that's something you need to put into your life, take a few moments just to talk to God about it right now. And say, Lord, I want to practice these things. I just don't want to come and hear the sermon and go home. I, I want to practice. Even one thing, if I can practice, is wonderful. Take it to heart. Say, God, help me practice this. Make it a part of my life. These are the teachings of Jesus. And Father, even as we stand here this morning, Father, we pray that you will give each of us the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of grace and prayer, the Spirit of supplication, that He will touch each of us, touch our lives, and help us to do these things that Jesus taught us. Help us to practice them in our lives. Make it a part of our lives. May the Holy Spirit help us to do these things. Father, even as we stand before you in your presence, we invite the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to touch each and every life. Your house will be a place of prayer, of praise and healing. And God, may your healing flow. To touch us, Lord, in the areas of our brokenness, in the areas of our pain, in the areas where we need healing, God. Let the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit flow right now to bring that healing into our lives. For those who are watching at home or wherever they may be, May the Holy Spirit minister to them right there in the name of the Lord Jesus. Even as we stand in your presence, in the mighty name of Jesus, 
I command sicknesses and diseases to leave and bodies to be healed, minds to be made whole, emotions to be made whole. By the anointing of the Holy Spirit, let every yoke of the enemy be destroyed, every burden of the enemy removed from of our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh God, you're the God who wipes away the tears of your people. You turn our mourning into dancing. You put off our sackcloth and you give us gladness. So let it happen, God. Let there be such a turnaround in the lives of your people. You said in your word that because of the anointing, there will be beauty for ashes. Let there be such a transformation in the lives of your people, Father. Thank you. Thank you. As we worship God, just welcome Him. Welcome Him to touch your life. Just minister to you, the Spirit of the living God. He's the one who heals and touches. And Just welcome Him as we just sing. Miracles happen when you move. Healing is calm in this room. Miracles happen when you move. Heaven is calm. Oh, miracles happen. Presence. Oh God, thank you for touching, for healing, for delivering your people. Thank you, Father, for your healing, your miracles, touching our lives. Thank you, oh God. Thank you.
And as you're standing here, just you pray and you say, God, I receive my healing, my miracle, whatever that is that you need. You say, Lord, I receive from you. Because you said in your house, your house will be a place of prayer and praise and healing. Same Jesus who healed then is here to heal now. To work miracles in our life situations. You receive. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Before we close this morning, I just want to give an invitation for anyone here. You've never received Jesus Christ into your life. I want to give an opportunity to do that. The Bible says that to everyone who received Him, to them He gives the power to become the children of God even to those who believe in His name. What a privilege. That if you receive Jesus Christ into your life, you believe in Jesus for who He is, He gives us the power, the right to become God's children, to have our sins forgiven, to be brought into the family of God, brought into a place of salvation. And if there's anyone here, maybe you're watching online, if you've never done this before in your life, you've never received Jesus Christ into your heart, your life, and said, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. I want to give us an opportunity to do that. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you'd like to do this, if you've never done this before, pray with me, please. I'll be going to celebrate with you. Let's pray. If you've never done this before and you want to pray with me this morning, just say this with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I believe you died for my sins on the cross. You were buried and you rose up again. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior and help me to follow you and you alone for the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone who prayed this prayer with me for the very first time? If you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time, we'd like to see your hands. Put your hand up. Just wave it at me. If you prayed this with me for the very first time in this place, anybody here, you prayed this with me for the very first time, could you put your hand up? Let's say this. Anyone here? Anyone here? Anyone here? There's one there. God bless you. Anybody else? Our ushers, our greeters will come to you and give you a bag. It's called the New Believers Bag. So anyone else here? You prayed this with me for the very first time. God bless you. God bless you. So Along with the back that they gave you is a small card that says decision card. Please write your name and number on that card and please give it back to them so that somebody from the church office will call you and they will guide you on how to use the resources that are in the back. So please do that and we'll also connect you with somebody who can help you make the spiritual journey to grow in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to dismiss Today, we have water baptism happening right after the service. Just one important announcement. Um, because of some, because of a lot of construction work is going on right behind this auditorium. So we cannot cut across this field. So you'll have to drive around and come in through the other gate entrance to get to the swimming pool. All right. So please remember this. Those of you who have come uh, prepared for water baptism, uh, you cannot, cannot walk across the field. So please drive around, come in through the other gate and the St. Joseph's Gate, Museum Road Gate, and then please come into the swimming pool. The pastoral team will be there. 12.45, our water baptism will start. And uh, God bless you, those of you who've come prepared for that. So we're going to close. We'll speak the benediction. One quick question, just to make sure you're listening. Where are we meeting next Sunday? 
at Wings Auditorium, okay? Please don't forget that. Okay, let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us, continue to strengthen us, continue to empower us, continue to encourage each of us always. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.